do you ever feel like there's so much focus on what your struggling student can't do that the person your child is gets lost in the shuffle? I remember many years ago at an IEP meeting, the parent came in and put a large frame photo of her son in the middle of the table and said, this is Jack. Let me tell you about Jack. And she shared all about her son, what he loved to do, what he was good at, what he was excited about, the friends he played with in the neighborhood. Before they started down the road of dissecting all the things that Jack couldn't do at school, she wanted to make sure that the team really knew who he was. Today, we're talking about educating the whole child. This is LD Expert Live. Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning differences, dyslexia, and attention challenges. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers and author of At Wit's End, A Parent's Guide to Ending the Struggle, Tears, and Turmoil of Learning Disabilities. To get a free copy, go to parentsatwitsend.com. Before we jump into our topic today, let's say hello to Lauren. Hello. Good morning, Lauren. Hello. Hello to everyone who is with us, watching us live. Let us know that you're here and where you're checking in from. We already have some people checking in. We have Mona. Good morning, SLC. I'm looking forward to hearing from Annette Mixon this morning. Mona from Santa Barbara, welcome. And Karen checking in from Sacramento, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, just a reminder, we have our monthly parent support group piece. Uh, we meet each month and our next meeting is this Thursday, May 20th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. It is a very popular topic, auditory processing. When we used to do these meetings in person, it was heavily attended. We had to always bring out extra chairs. And now that we are virtual and opening it up to everyone, um, it is something that a lot of people are RSVPing to. So um, if you do want to be part of that conversation, it is a Zoom meeting. If you want to participate and join, you do need to register. Go to stolecenter.com slash peace to get the registration link uh, in order to join the meeting. And I really look forward to meeting a lot of you parents, answering your questions on auditory processing and having a really lively discussion because uh, it is a hot topic. And for parents, um, as parents, teachers, therapists, helping struggling students, it's very easy to get caught up in the challenges we're trying to address. Um, but our students are also funny and talented and daring. That's why I love my job. Um, we don't want to overlook that. So while we're talking about educating the whole child today, post in the comments something about your child that makes you smile. We want to celebrate that. And I'll go first because I get a chance to brag about my own kid. Um, my daughter, Cammie, I've, I've spoken about her on the show before. She's five years old and, and five is a magical time. Um, and she's really into magic and powers and things like that, you know, fantasy. So she thinks she has magical powers right now. And she likes to put magic spells. And so right now she puts magic spells on the baby, um, her, her little sister, Abby. And so she'll put a spell on her before she goes to bed um, to get her to sleep through the night and help mommy. And when she wakes up in the morning, she's like, did, did she sleep through the night? And if she did, she's like, okay, my spell worked. And if she didn't, she's oh, I did the wrong spell. So that's what makes me smile about Cammie. And I just need to love this phase of life. And it's easy when you're a parent and dealing with all the day to day to forget about those things that make you smile about your kids. So post in the comments something that makes you smile about your child. We have some more people checking in. Julia from Dallas. Hello. Um, welcome again. Post comments and questions for today's discussion and what makes you smile about your child in the comments. And we'll check back in in a little bit. Great. Thank you, Lauren. I love that, that story about helping mom out by putting a magic spell so Abby can sleep through the night. That's so awesome. This is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers. Our guest today is Annette Mixon. Annette has a master's degree in adult education and program planning, as well as a bachelor's degree in sociology 
and a multiple subjects teaching credential. Throughout her career as an educator, small business owner, consultant, and manager in the private franchise and public education sectors, Annette has been focused on the importance of education and the benefits of personalized learning. Welcome, Annette. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm very excited to be here. And I also love that story about being magical because those are the things that you learn about students that are exciting to them. So thank you so much for having me. Oh, well, we're delighted to have you. So you are currently the San Francisco Bay Area Regional Director for Futures Academy, right? Sure. Correct. So give us a quick introduction to Futures. Well, talking about the whole child is what Futures Academy is really all about. We are a very unique school. It, we have a one-to-one -one model. We call it School Reimagined. And our school, um, it's so exciting that the kids actually get to have their very own teacher who, if they are interested in magical spells, they can kind of use that as a platform to teach them. And that's, we have four pillars uh, that our school is founded upon. And those four pillars are transformative academics, um, happiness, connected community, and pursue your passion. And all of these things are so interrelated and so connected. And that transformative academic piece is hugely important because of that whole student. Uh, this model allows you to really figure out what is interesting to the student and relate it to the academics. So I love those four pillars uh, of futures because it really does include you know, of course, the academic piece, which is so important, but it includes a much more well-rounded look at each student. So let's talk about those, because I think they're so critical in any education setting for educating the whole child. So, so let's talk about that pillar of happiness. How is that taught or infused at Futures? Great question. And it is something that was so exciting to me when I found this school, because it isn't something that we talk about often enough at school. You know, we talk about reading and arithmetic and all these kinds of things, but happiness with all the research that has been done has shown that students who are happier perform better in school, they get better grades. Um, and, you know, obviously it's a, it's a skill for life that we can help them understand is something they do have some power over. Mm -hmm. You know, although there's a lot of research that says, you know, there's there's temperament and personality. I think the, the statistic is 40% of it is choices that you make on a daily basis, choices that you make to be happy. So we've done, we have a whole series of courses and, you know, how different schools have different requirements. We have a couple of classes, uh, the science of learning and the science of happiness that are, mm -hmm part of our curriculum of uh, the science of learning is based on Carol Dweck's growth mindset. And our happiness course is actually based on, um, for those of you who don't know, one of Yale's most popular classes in their whole 317 years is a class on happiness. And it has become one of their most popular attended schools. Coursera now has a course that's based on theirs. And that's kind of what we utilized for our happiness course. So we do have a course that teaches students how to be happy and how to really understand what that is and the choices they can make on a daily basis. You know, that is one of those things that I think is, we don't really think about teaching, you know? I mean, it's, I've never heard it. Uh, actually included in a curriculum. So I think that is amazing. And, and as a requirement, that's, that's amazing. But also, you know, just helping kids understand the science of happiness, that they have some control and the science of learning, they actually have some control. Because I think a lot of times, students don't really feel like they have control. Yep. So, um, Talk a little bit about that, that growth mindset. That's, you know, that was something that even I learned that was very exciting. Uh, one of my favorite little pieces that always sticks with me is, 
you know, again, having been in the education community for years, you know, working with parents and students, I can't tell you how many times even parents have said things like, oh, I'm just not good at math as they're talking about their student, you know, like you were talking about earlier, the things we're not good at. And the one piece that I thought was really clever is with growth mindset, you want to add one word to that sentence and no longer say, I'm not good at math without saying, I'm not good at math yet. And that's part of Carol Dweck's, you know, really helping students understand that, you know, not everybody's going to be an expert at everything, but you can learn and it is not something that you're just naturally not good at. You can become better. And I think we had the conversation about the book Outliers for Mm -hmm. those who may be familiar with it. And that book is so fascinating because it says, yes, we all, we may tend to have certain talents that are either passions or they are talents, but even people who are Olympic gymnasts, it's not strictly some kind of innate talent that they had, they practiced, they learned, Mm -hmm. they, they reviewed their skill set. And, you know, I think it was 10,000 hours or something like that is what it takes to become that expert. But I think most of us don't understand. And I think with students in particular, it's so helpful for them to understand that that's why we do want them to practice. They don't ever have to be perfect. And they may not be good at it yet. But with that practice, and with that growth mindset, you know, they can explore more things in life and they can have more options and they can, like you said, really see themselves as a whole person with multiple talents and multiple abilities. And they, and they feel like they have more control, you know, that they really do have a role that they can play. So we definitely find that when kids have that growth mindset and they believe that what they do actually can have an impact, um, that it's not just set in stone, this is how I am, I'm never going to be able to change. Um, They're much more open to learning and more successful. And I love that you're at just adding one little word, yet. I'm not good at math yet. I love that. Yeah. Because I think all of us, even as adults, you know, like, oh, I'm not the best listener yet, (laughs) or whatever skill we are, you know, working on. Um, But I think with kids in particular, you know, we need to model that as adults. And that's another Mm -hmm. thing about our schools that is so amazing is the relationship and the mentoring that's, that's able to happen in a one to one model. I mean, when you have your very own teacher that can really dig into these concepts and help you understand those pathways to get there, Mm -hmm. because they can look at you again, not as the things you can't do, but let's figure out how we can do this. And it just is so much easier for somebody when you have that one-to-one opportunity. Yeah, it it definitely is. I mean, there's nothing quite like that one-to-one model at Stowell Learning Centers, we work one-to-one with students as well because it allows us to target the specific areas that each student needs to develop. But even though our situation and that at Futures is pretty ideal, you know, I think the principles that you're talking about still really apply everywhere, at home, at school, as we develop, you know, the whole child. So let's talk a little bit about the um, the pillar about pursuing your passion. How do you build that in? Well, pursue your passion is really kind of having the students think about what they enjoy and what they want to look at for their future. And we do have a lot of courses that are based on career type pathways, everything from Um, entrepreneurship and forensic science and um, gosh, of course, right now, robotics and game design, but also, um, oh, I can't even think of all of them, but they're all classes that are courses for credit that are opportunities even starting at middle school and into high school for you to explore. Because, you know, we've all done that where we think we want to do something, we get into it and then we're like, oh, I don't know if I really like that as much as I thought I would. And it's so nice to be able to explore those kinds of passions at a younger age to give you that time to, to shape if this really is the direction that you want to go. 
And you're right, that's something that I think we could do more in all of our schools, starting at a younger age or as a parent at home, um, you know, gosh, who knows, being magical, as Laura was talking about, could be something that could lead in a direction if you just explore those things with kids and really have them, you know, like really tap into when they say something, when they talk about things or when they're watching television, keep an eye on the things mm. that seem to excite them and interest them and think about how those are pathways to pursue their passions, to see if that could turn into you know, some sort of, of, of that outlier area where they can become that, that expert, where they can really pursue something that makes them happy, which is also then connected to the happiness pillar. Mm -hmm. You know, I think so often it, there's so much pressure now for kids when they enter their freshman year in college to know exactly what they want to do and have their path all set out. And a lot of freshmen do not know what they want to do, but but they can't do college in four years. It's going to take them five or six if unless they start right away as a freshman. And um, so, you know, just the idea of exploring, not being pressured to pick a career or anything Yep. Um, when they're in junior high or high school, but just thinking, what do I love to do? How are some ways that that shows up in the world, you know? Right. And I think, you know, that is something that for those of us, you know, that went through school and got through four years and then we're like, hmm, I'm not sure if this really is what I want to be doing. Like I mentioned before, I would have loved to have had the opportunity at a younger age to, per to you know, explore more of those options um, you know, of course, we need to learn to read and to write. And, you know, we need some of those things. But I think it's really interesting, you know, to think about how we can reshape, you know, some of the opportunities for kids um, in school, especially starting at middle school. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, you know, that pillar of pursue your passion is something that we want our kids to really explore. And I think it's something that is a great opportunity for, again, parents and teachers everywhere to really be looking at, you know, what do kids write about if they are asked to write a paper? Um, what do they talk about? What do they come in and, and, you know, what are they excited about? And really trying to think about ways that that can be connected to a passion for the future somehow. That is great stuff. Just, you know, as parents and teachers, just paying attention and engaging with some of those things. Yep. Great. So let's talk about uh, the connected community pillar. That one is wonderful too. You know, a lot of people, especially at our particular school or the one-to-one -one schools, they wonder how do the kids get that social aspect. And because of the way the model works, there is, there are, there is free time a little bit more than a traditional school because of our kind of more appointment-based learning. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of opportunities for the kids to come together for clubs, which again is another opportunity for them to uh, experience leadership in a way that they might not get to in a larger school. But again, it's also an opportunity for us as adults to think about opportunities for our kids in any way possible to help them learn those kinds of leadership roles, again, pursuing their passion. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, if you have students that are really into music, then we have a music club and we have a cooking club. We've had movie clubs, game clubs, because kids all love the games. Right. Um, but we also have our volunteer requirements and our student government. So all of these things exist at you know, the smaller school, just like they do at a larger school. But I think, again, it's an opportunity for all of us to think about how those experiences also shape our young people, our students, in terms of you know, helping them become part of a society and a community where volunteering and helping and understanding what's going on around them is something important. And it's been very exciting to see the kids come to the table with their own ideas about mm -hmm. what they want to do and get the, the rest of the group excited about it. Everything from volunteering at an animal hospital or shelter. Um, we had one of the campuses where they made blankets for homeless people. Mm -hmm. They have, um, you know, gone to the fire department to understand more what our firefighters do. So they organize 
the connected community is the group of students and the teachers coming together and organizing clubs and volunteer activities throughout the year, along with, you know, uh, showcases, um, you know, during different, like, you know, different months where there's mm -hmm. going to be different topics and the parents are invited in. Um, it's the end of the year right now. They're doing showcases, science projects. So we sometimes match the students up so they can do a project together, which is very fun. We had uh, one of the campuses up here where baking cookies was part of the experiment together. So they <laughs> tried different recipes and different heat temperatures and so fun. <laughs> but yeah. So, I mean, we just try and find ways. And again, in some ways it's easier to create that connected community in a small format just because it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a lot more work when you have a large, large campus, but nevertheless, the whole point is no matter where your child is finding those communities, mm -hmm. you know, in some way, shape or form based on those interests, there's so many great community venues for that, but that connected community, helping them understand, especially in the world right now with everything that's been going on, what is their role and what is their place in that and what can they do to make a difference? Mm -hmm. And I think that is, you know, as you said, with everything going on now in the world, you know, it's it's more important than ever. You know, there's been a huge concern about mental health with our teens in particular over the last year. And and for them, a sense of purpose and impact is huge. And so really putting some focus on a bigger community uh, takes the focus off of themselves and how it challenging everything is right now and just helps them to think better and uh, to think bigger, you know, like right. I can have an impact. I can have an impact on somebody else. So I think that's, you know, that's great. And I, I, I do think I'm hearing from more and more schools that there is kind of a focus on community service. And, and I think there's a huge place for it. Right. I mean, there, you know, there are, there are so many opportunities to understand the world differently than we ever have before. Mm -hmm. And that we can't just sit back that we do have to participate. And I think it's a great opportunity, like I said, for kids to understand both at a level that what's fun for them so that people mm -hmm. they can connect with, with things that they like to do, but also looking outside of themselves, looking at you know, people who have different opportunities or come from a different world and really understanding how we can all work together. Mm -hmm. So it's it's fun. It's really fun to see. The thing that's also really amazing is hearing what the kids come up with. You know, it's, sometimes it's just really wonderful for them to have these ideas of things that they want to do. And, you know, that is, again, so heartwarming and exciting to know that if we allow these students to explore these things, they're going to come up with things that are better than we could come up with. So, yeah. And, and it's kind of magical to see what they do come up with. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we've talked about, uh, happiness, pursuing your passion, and connected community. So of course, uh, we also have to include academics in there. And and I notice your pillar there at Futures is transformative academics. So let's talk about that. Well, again, I think transforming, I mean, one of our, you know, every life is transformed by learning is one of our, our it's our mission, it's our vision. And so it's the opportunity to take something that we all need to do, which is, you know, learn to read and write and, and uh, be part of this world in terms of, you know, just the things that we have to do. So transformative academics is when, again, we can personalize it and individualize it to that point of really looking at the child for who they are. And I'll give one of my favorite examples. I use this all the time, but being on the campuses and walking around and listening to the teachers have conversations with their students. Um, you know, a lot of kids really struggle with like Shakespeare, for example, let's take 10th grade, 11th grade English and Shakespeare is, you know, something that has traditionally been taught. And this particular instance, the concept was anti-heroes in English and literature. 
And so they were kind of talking through what an anti-hero was. And they kind of talked a little bit about why Shakespeare is usually used. But as they talked through, they ended up landing on using the movie Ant-Man and Wasp Girl as their topic for, for exploring anti-heroes. Because, you know, in the end, what's important is the concept. You know, yes, they, they know who Shakespeare is, but we want them to actually internalize and understand what is the concept of an anti-hero and be able to, to share that and express that and understand it in a way that's personal to them. So that's just an example of, you know, some of the ways that we can make it very personal. Um, a couple of other examples, I just got to see one of the campuses uh, for biology, a student who was an art student, um, instead of just doing a traditional list of plants and their, I, I, I'm not even going to say this correctly, their phylum and their, you know, how they're categorized, they decided to create what they called a plantopoly board, which was basically a monopoly board. But instead of all the streets, they had used the plants and they put the details of the plants and that was their project. Or I think, you know, there's just different ways that because of this one-to-one -one model and other places can do it too. It just, you know, it's a little bit different um, depending on where you are, but even at home, letting your students take what's what they're passionate about. I think one of the other ones, this was again, the same campus that one of the students, uh, it was a Spanish class. And, but this, this person was passionate about entrepreneurship and wanting to open their own restaurant. So they created a menu entirely in Spanish Mm -hmm. um, with the headlines and all the different things. So again, it's kind of taking your traditional learning and being able to put that spin that really addresses the whole child and really allows them to dig in and get excited about learning because they're getting to apply it to something that matters to them, to something that, that they can see having a purpose in their life in some way, shape or form. I love that. Those are those are great examples and I can see how kids would get they you know you make you make a plantopoly board <laughs> and you are going to learn those those plant names and and which ones go together and I, I mean it's just it's great ideas. You know, we have some very very creative teachers out there and we just need to remember that academics the purpose of it is so they can go out into the world and yeah. use it yes. and uh, not just so they can take a test. And exactly. uh, so we just, we, we've just got to keep that bigger picture in mind all the time. Yep. No, but, and that's so true because in the end, you know, that's what we want. We want them to remember that when they take it out into the world. So that's, it's, it, yeah, if you can, just, you know, repeat it on a test, that's fine, I guess. But again, what's really more important is that transformation, that ability to, to grow and move on to the next step with, you know, all of the information that you learn and getting passionate about something. So mm -hmm. that? Um, and, and seeing how it relates in the world. Weren't you telling me a story about when you were in school and you had to graph ellipses or something. And you're like, okay, why do I have to do this? Yes, it was, gosh, it was once I was in college and exactly that we were graph, you know, I was diligently doing my math work, putting my dots on the X, Y axis. And, you know, I, I've always was interested and did pretty well in that, but I realized all of a sudden I was like, why, what, what's the purpose? What is this? Why, why do I need an X, Y axis? What's the purpose of an ellipse? And I kind of raised my hand and I was like, what, what is the purpose of this? And I'll never forget, my professor stopped the class and he kind of laughed and he asked what I was going to school for, what my profession was gonna be. And I told him probably education or you know some kind of social work, something like that at the time, that's what I was looking at. And he laughed and he said, well, you may not need to know it for that, but let me tell you. And he went on to explain that a car headlight is in the shape of an ellipse. And that a woofer on a stereo was in the shape of an ellipse. So he started, and then I was like, oh, engineering, got it. You know, now this is actually more interesting mm -hmm. because I'm doing, in, I'm doing engineering. And I, it really hit me like a ton of bricks. It's like, wow, why didn't anyone ever tell me that before? 
why didn't somebody explain that we're doing these things because this is how you might be able to use it in the future? And I think, you know, sometimes, again, we forget to do that with students to remind them, you know, again, one of the things with something as simple as percentages with math, you know, mm -hmm. if you're going to go shopping or if you're going to the restaurant, but just always helping, those are super basic, but always helping students understand why and the purpose for something they're doing. And yes, that was a moment for me that just really <laughs> was like, I'll never forget it. Yeah. Well, learning is so much more engaging when there's a relevant application for it. Yep. So uh, this is, this has been really nice to think about, you know, it makes me excited about education, you know, um, there are so many ways to make it personal. And I think, you know, it's going to be interesting right now, too, with with this year, how it's been and with Zoom and with kind of having to rethink things. I'm, I imagine classroom teachers all over are going to be really, you know, thinking about how to help students catch up. And I think really understanding some of the importance of getting them engaged and excited mm -hmm. and and looking at different ways to do projects and things that they can do. Um, because that's one of the other things that we really do encourage is, you know, we want that support and that mentoring to be there, but we also mm -hmm. want children to learn that resilience and that ability to be independent and to take initiative. And I think, you know, that's one of the other things that, you know, really helping students understand that you're there to support them, but ultimately they have to take some of that responsibility, that that's part of the transformation as well. Mm -hmm. Well, this is great. Thank you, Annette. This is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers, and we've been talking with Annette Mixon, Regional Director of Futures Academy, about keys to building healthy, well-rounded students. Let's check in with Lauren and all of you in the chat. Hello, I, I love everything that we've been discussing. I, like I said, this is, um, you know, the thing I love about my job is working in the centers and getting to know our kids kind of on this level and exploring their passions and just really seeing what makes them tick. That is such an enjoyable part of my job. And um, I'm now really enjoying reading some of the, the comments of parents sharing about what makes um, them smile, what their kids do that makes them smile. So we're gonna we're gonna share a few because uh, they're they're really endearing. So Karen says, my son is so funny, sometimes intentionally and sometimes just because of his style. For example, he likes to share historical stories in history class as if he is the teacher. Mm -hmm. This makes his teacher and I laugh at the comfort level he has with sharing in like a teacher like style. So that's what makes her her laugh about her son. Um, let's see here. Catherine, um, she just said, I love your question to share endearing stories about our children. And then she posted, um, a longer story. And so I'm going to paraphrase, uh, let's see. It's basically, um, so her, her son, um, was getting really frustrated with his siblings and he, he, he wanted to, to kind of quit back at them, like get back at them and say the meanest thing he could because he was so mad. And then there was all this buildup. And then he says the meanest thing he could call someone. And he says, well, you're just iron buns. And so <laughs> and his mom is just burst out laughing, wanted to know, where did you hear that? And he said he heard it from a Canadian Mountie, um, <laughs> something with horseback riding. <laughs> and as she probed more and more, it just, the story got more and more hilarious because she could see his like way of thinking and just kind of what he thought was an insult. <laughs> and it just, <laughs> it just made her laugh. And it's like, yes, that's, I mean, it's those kinds of stories that you want to tell. She, she wrote like kind of a blog post about it. Um, Catherine did. So thank you for sharing that because it's, those are the things like as parents that, you know, I, when my kids get older, I'm probably, you know, those kinds of endearing stories that, that I'm going to want to share about them and embarrass them at their weddings or things like that. <laughs> um, yeah. And like, you know, I, I can tell you so many stories about students at the, at the learning center, just like these really endearing, like, wow, you thought about something completely different than I did. And it was amazing. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's so much fun. Um, Karen also is commenting. I love this topic. My son believes he is no good at art when we're talking about 
that growth mindset. I know that means he just wasn't exposed to the right art educator. This year, seventh grade, he had an optional elective class and we nudged him to choose art. With great reservation, he took the class. It was taught by his favorite teacher who doubles as his science teacher. She has nurtured them and has re- he has really enjoyed the class, recognizing that he has a creative side, especially with clay. Mm-hmm. The point is the right, let me see, get it right here. The right teacher can change a child's perception of their abilities. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That is so true. Um, And she adds that, by the way, he's already planned to take eighth grade art elective next year, too, even though he could take something else. So, you know, really, that was a transformative academic for him, Um, you know, just kind of knowing that he had this ability where something in something that he did not feel good about himself previously, just having that right teacher. Um, and Courtney chiming in, she was calling kind of what you were describing with transformative academics as higher education play-based learning. It's kind of, it kind of is, so it has that kind of college thinking style where we explore, you know, academics kind of out of the box, but it's also play-based and, and getting our kids to, uh, be able to explore academics in another way really brings out the, that creativity and that passion. It's just the way education should have been, right? And when I was in school to learn to become a teacher, I mean, that's kind of what I envisioned. Unfortunately, that's not always how it how it it plays out, though. But it's just amazing to hear these stories because our kids, you know, they always surprise us. So mm-hmm. that's the piece that sometimes we miss if we're just always focused on what they can't do or always focused on just getting those academics in. Right. Um, you know, Lauren, you made me think of that comment made me think of um, Annette, when we were talking earlier, you said something about in it with education, you just need to learn to be a better detective in the world. And that really resonated with me. I mean, if we're always trying to help our, our staff, help our kids discover, discover yeah. how it works see if it worked. If they thought about something, well, let's check it out and see if it works that way. And, and I think if, if we can look at learning like that as an exploration and discovery, you know, and being a detective, it's just, it, it puts a little bit different mindset and spin on learning. Well, and that reminds me of one thing that used to just actually make me laugh with the kids where, you know, if you ask them a couple questions and they'll say, I don't know. And sometimes it's a simple saying, well, what if you did know? And all oh, of a sudden like they'll that. answer something and you're like, mm-hmm. it, it's kind of fascinating. It's almost funny where it's like, well, what if you did know? And, you know, it doesn't always work, but it works a lot more often than you would think when they say, I don't know, to just respond, well, what if you did know, then what would your answer be? Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it is those kinds of detective and just kind of to keep digging a little deeper and kind of say how so, and we actually call it double clicking, even with our, our skills with talking with people, like, tell me more. What do you mean by that? Because sometimes, again, with kids, we may think they, we know what they're talking about, but if you dig a little deeper, like I think Lauren, you were kind of saying, like, what does that really mean? Or with the Canadian Mountie, how did you, how did you come up with that with the one example? I mean, if you dig in, that's where you can find some of those great little, we can be detectives as well as them to find those little tidbits that are going to help us help them find their passions and their, their transformations. So Absolutely. So great. So parents keep posting little stories about what makes you smile about your child. um, And we'll check back in in a little bit. Great. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you, everyone, for sharing your stories. That's so fun. Yep. So, Annette, let's talk a little bit about testing. How does testing help your mission to educate the whole child? Ah, testing. What a huge, huge conversation that can be. Um, You know, it's very interesting because, again, in our school setting over the years, um, standardized testing has, you know, become a very ingrained part of, of, of what we do. And, you know, at the same time, I, again, after years of, of dealing with different types of standardized testing, it's such a snapshot Mm -hmm. of, of who a, a student is. It's important, you know, we have to be able, you know, I'll just take it from the perspective of WASC accreditation, for example, you know, we do 
need to be able to measure things to some degree. However, you know, we can become a little too one-sided on certain things where there's too much emphasis. And again, this could be another whole conversation that you've probably had with some of your other experts that goes along with SAT and ACT testing right now and where that is kind of starting to shift in the paradigm of, of what's important in getting into college. But, you know, it is, it is an important piece. And at, at, at Futures Academy, we use um, what we call map testing. It's uh, the Northwest Association of Education, uh, Northwest Education Association, and it's uh, measures of progress. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's basically a nationally recognized standardized test. And the good thing for us, though, is that what we can do is utilize it to help our teachers understand the students a little bit better um, in terms of what they were, what they found easy on the assessment. I, I often laugh mm -hmm. and say a student can, bl can, can blow off a test and not do well when they really have the potential to do better. But it's really hard for kids to guess good, you know, to guess so well that they get things right, at, you know, and score really high on a standardized test. So it's kind of an interesting tool and a snapshot to use to look and see a lot about a kid. Again, a, a student who's maybe gifted and is just going through and clicking through because they they are bored by the assessment. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a different help, a different snapshot of that assessment than a student who struggles, than your student somewhere in the middle. But it's 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 an interesting conversation um, because again, there are things that you can learn from it. There's things that too much emphasis is, can be placed on it. Uh, but again, like what I was saying, for example, on the math portion of this map assessment, you know, we can see if something was easy for students, then our teachers know that they they can probably not spend as much time on that. And the areas where they struggled a little bit more, that's where they can spend more time. So, you know, if long division is difficult, but they have their math facts down, that's good insight for a teacher to have. And that's one nice thing about the assessment that we use is it does break that down. Um, but I think, you know, Historically, there's been a lot of emphasis put on those test scores that, again, you know, that's it's a hugely, I don't know if it's political or what their word is, a debate, an academic debate. Um, but I think really utilizing it for a snapshot of who that student is and looking at it not only from the scores, but how they approach the assessment, uh, the amount of time they take on the assessment and, you know, how they feel about assessments. It doesn't take into account that some students are just, they're just petrified when tests happen. Mm -hmm. And yet you give them the same information and say, it's a project, create a plantopoly board and they can remember everything. So, you know, the, the testing really fits in as, as, a, as a requirement, you know, in terms of, you know, most schools are required to do this. And it is really good information to be able to measure growth because, you know, measurement is important. But I think more importantly, it's looking at the test score as, again, a part of who that whole child is, not the whole picture whatsoever. It is not a whole picture. It is, it is a snapshot. And it's sometimes more about their personalities or their fears than it is about their abilities, if that makes sense. Absolutely. You know, tests seem so important and official. But you're right, they don't always show the whole story. You know, when we do our initial testing at the Learning Center, um, we typically have already had a conversation with the parent, and I'm sure that's the case at Futures as well. And so that provides us a context that's and a bigger picture of that child, you know, than you're going to get in just a testing session alone. Yep. Once in a while, a parent will actually write up a narrative about their child and send it to us with their initial paperwork. And I find that so helpful, along with our testing and observations, in getting a picture of the whole child. And in fact, I would really encourage you, parents, to do that, to write up mm -hmm. a little narrative about your child whenever your child is having initial testing done at school or for an outside therapy. I would also encourage you to do it just before your annual IEP meeting because it gives the team some really good insights about what has occurred over that 
year um, that and they wouldn't have normally had that. So that's something I would encourage you to do as being the evaluator. I certainly have found that to be very helpful in giving me a bigger picture of a child. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that we, you know, it is important when you're talking to a family, again, it's back to what I was talking about, double clicking, asking those questions so that you can really understand, you know, what makes a child tick, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, like what things are comfortable for them, what things do they struggle with? When did it start? But that's a great recommendation to, to, have parents in their own mind go through that narrative, you know, to like, how do you describe your child? And, you know, because again, all these great stories that people are sharing, that's, that's your child too. It's not just their scores. It's not just their grades. It's, you know, who they are as a person. And I think by sharing those, it's hugely valuable for teachers, for administrators, for anybody to, it's to know who that child is. Um, to understand their personality a little bit better, what's important to them, uh, their background, their history. And so I think that's really great and interesting advice that, again, the test is one piece of it. There's a whole picture that goes along with it. Right, right. So Annette, your teachers at Futures and ours at Stowell Learning Centers are very good at individualizing learning. Uh, both based on the information that we get in the initial assessment process. And then as we get to know the kids, you know, really individualizing it. Parents of struggling students often find themselves kind of in that teacher role, reteaching and studying for tests with their kids. So I'm wondering if you can share some tips for personalizing learning so that their kids are more willing to engage and so they'll retain the information better. Well, and I think, you know, kind of some of the things we talked about before with making things into a project or kind of trying to find out, you know, what are the, um, the things that, that their kids do enjoy doing that they get excited about. Um, and that's actually a really great question. I mean, to some degree, it is talking with your own classroom teachers to get get strategies, <clears throat> excuse me, but also, you know, depending on what it is they need to get done, sometimes just sitting with them, helping them ask questions, mm -hmm. you know, back to what I was saying too, like, well, if they're like, well, I don't know how to do this. It's like, well, what if you did know? Or let's talk about, you know, like, how about some of your friends and, and just really having conversations with them, I think, engaging them. Uh, to learn a little bit more about, you know, what it is that is making it difficult for them. I mean, and this is, this is mm -hmm. definitely something we all struggle with all of the time. I mean, at Futures Academy, just like anywhere else, our biggest, our biggest struggle sometimes is getting them to do the homework, for example. Um, so trying to figure out ways that that we can make it more palatable to them is, is often difficult. I mean, I don't certainly have any magic, magic uh, answers. I wish I could be magical uh, like Lauren's mm -hmm. daughter, but um, I think talking with the teachers, talking with your school, talking with your student, finding out, you know, what are you willing to do? If this is, if you don't want to do this, what do you feel like would be helpful in terms of if you need to know this, what, you know, letting them maybe have a little bit more say in what it should look like. And at the same time, sometimes that's hard because, you know, depending on our students, some of them are just going to say, it's not important. I don't have to do it. And that's the reality. We have to continue to kind of sometimes just say it's part of what we have to do. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think individualizing it, just like I was giving those examples is, is talking through a concept and, helping them understand how you use it as a parent. Um, I know a lot of parents do things like when you're cooking or when you're shopping, you know, help have having your child do the math instead of you doing it, like having them look at, you know, the ingredients or, you know, talking about things that are happening in the home in the context of education and their activities that they're doing at school. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure if that really answers exactly, you know, the question, but I think a lot of it just is a lot of it's having conversation and letting the kids kind of express themselves 
and what they find important about something or what they don't find important. Cause it even goes back to what I was saying about why am I doing this? And I think I shared with you too. I had to laugh one time. One of the students was doing geometry and was like, Oh, why do I have to do this? And as we were having the conversation and I was, we ended up talking about what are some of the things that he might want to be in the future an architect came up and I almost had to fall over laughing. I'm like, you do realize that that's exactly what architects ha- have to do is measure and look at angles. And, you know, so I, I think there's also, you know, something to that flipped learning model where you really have them take pictures of angles in a house. Like if they're learning angles and geometry, you know, have them look around and say, where's a right angle? What, what, you know, just how, again, whatever you can kind of do to, to relate, education mm-hmm. and academics to the world around them is always going to be an interesting thing for them to think about. Definitely. Um, making it real and relevant. And then also, as you said, making it palatable. So breaking it into small bites um, is really helpful. Yep. This is LD Expert Live. Let's check back in with Lauren and our viewers before we wrap up. Hello. So I I just want to say that I don't think I did Catherine's story justice. So I just want to <laughs> um, elaborate just a little bit um, because I was multitasking and she and she went on. She was really highlighting uh, for her son kind of the nuances of the English language and how you know that just the way that we use language sometimes can be confusing for students. So he, you know, he was thinking iron buns and then the term buns of steel, like thinking that those are the same thing. Um, He, in his mind, comedian and uh, pediatrician, they have the same ending. And so he thought that a pediatrician was a person who told jokes to kids. And I mean, it just like, those are like those opportunities. And then it's like a gateway to explore language and vocabulary. And we've definitely done that in the learning center. Um, and, and so, but you have to, you have to go there with kids and, and, and really understand their way, way of thinking um, and not just like, no, that's wrong. Um, and so it just reminded me of so many conversations I've had um, a long time ago when I, when I, about 15 years ago, when I barely first started um, at the Learning Center, we had a student and we were reading a story and he came across the term in a pickle. Um, and it just really confused him. He was, he was on the spectrum and he just like at first, like it was just really confused about like, how did he get in that pickle? Like, why is he inside a pickle? And we, it, it was an opportunity though, to really explore idioms mm-hmm. and like, what does that mean? And, and so, and it eventually became a joke and with this student and I, I loved it because we got to explore whenever we come across an idiom or figurative language. And there's actually a book called in a pickle um, that, that is about idioms for kids. Um, He would do. So every single time, it didn't matter what it was, raining cats and dogs, something like that. He would do, he would go in a pickle like that and (laughs) and do that. And that meant, but he, he understood, he's starting to get that language. And it was just, anyways, one of the most enduring, I have a, a ton of these endearing stories about our kids and making connections with learning. Um, and Catherine's story reminded me of that. So thank you for sharing again um, with that, Catherine. Um, let's see, Crystal is sharing, my son struggles with writing and drawing and other school activities, but he loves numbers with a passion and mm-hmm. uses them in such a creative and natural way. He will fall asleep dividing and multiplying numbers and he is only very young. He dives deeply into math in such an inquisitive way. It makes me smile. I Mm -hmm. love that. Yes, our our math brain kids. And we got to appreciate that with them. Um, And then Courtney is chiming in. She's saying, I'm so happy to hear like-minded educational professionals. I feel so ignored in early childhood education. And that's sad, especially in early childhood Mm -hmm. education. That is where we should be exploring passions and, and, you know, supporting all of those kind of little busy, busy bodies and busy minds um, 
that's really where education should be, should start to be engaging and interesting. So mm-hmm. sorry to hear that, that we've deviated that far. Um, so parents, thank you so much for sharing. I mean, this is this is really fun to read a lot of these comments and to, to reminisce on, um, you know, my own experiences being a teacher and working as a clinician in our centers, because this is what this is what makes learning fun and gets us to appreciate our kiddos. Um, I just want to um, if you have further questions or want to continue the conversation, we do have our private Facebook group, Mom Squad. Um, you can request to join and get resources. I posted several resources in the guide section, as well as you can hear from the community. It is a community of parents who have children and teens with learning and attention challenges. Um, it is a private Facebook group, so you do need to request to join. You can find it on our Facebook page or by going to Facebook groups and searching the keywords SLC Mom Squad to find us. Look for the logo, the Mom Squad logo. Um, and again, I want to remind you that Thursday is our Peace meeting on auditory processing. Peace is our parent support group. That's where you get resources and understanding and just really explore different topics. We go through Jill's book at Wit's End and really explore these topics and what uh, learning challenges look like in your home um, and hopefully give you some guidance um, and some understanding. So um, you do need to sign up right now. Again, we are filling up. We have a limited uh, number of attendees that can attend that meeting. So go to stolecenter.com slash peace to register to join that meeting. So I look forward to seeing a lot of you, even if it is your little Zoom boxes. Um, I really enjoy peace. It's, it's a great discussion we've been having. And thank you, Annette, for, for opening up this conversation and for getting us to uh, enjoy your students and reminisce on, on all of those fun stories with our students. Well, and thank you. And thanks for all you do, um, you know, for the educators and parents and you know, being able to really look at things differently and figure out how to be the detectives in unlocking the secret to, you know, how to make learning fun and how to make it part of the future for your mm-hmm. students. And I know Liz, hearing about early childhood education, that's a whole other area that, mm-hmm. you know, all of these things are even as applicable, if not more so when they're young, because they are so open and so ready to explore. So. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Lauren, and everyone who shared with us today. This is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stoll here with our guest, Annette Mixon. We've been talking about educating the whole child. Annette, this has been a really fun discussion, very uplifting. And, uh, you know, we kind of all need that about education right now because we've just sort of been in this damper of all the challenges with online schools. So thank you so much for that. What last thoughts do you have for our viewers today? You know, I just, I really think, you know, keeping in mind always that that concept of the whole child and really, you know, back to the very beginning of the conversation, finding what makes life magical for your, for your student or what resonates with them and doing our best as adults and educators to figure out how to connect those things and relate those things. And remember that our, our children are more than just academics, that they are people that have interests and they are looking to have that. I mean, I think they're just hungry for that. So the more we can do as educators to help them explore that and I kind of now that you mentioned it, it's like, you know, we have to be educational detectives to figure that out. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Annette. Thank you so much for sharing some really critical pieces of educating and growing our kids. I know my kids would have loved attending a school <laughs> like Futures. Yes, it's a really, it's, it is reimagined. That's for sure. It's uh, something I wish everybody could experience. So. It's great having that one-to-one model. Yeah. Well, here is the contact information for Annette and Futures Academy. Futures serves students grades 6 through 12 in an empowering, individualized learning environment. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, auditory processing, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Next Tuesday, we have Dr. Dan Peters with us. 
he will be talking about parenting twice exceptional learners, those really bright or talented students who also struggle socially or in school. Dr. Peters has a real heart for gifted kids and their parents and so many practical tools to share. Be sure to join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Stowell Learning Centers are open for remote sessions and screenings. We're also seeing students on site with all of the COVID precautions. We help children and adults resolve their learning and attention challenges, including dyslexia, by identifying and developing the underlying processing or learning skills at the root of the problem. If you would like a free consultation for yourself or your child, give us a call or visit our website at stowellcenter.com. Thank you again, Annette, and thank you all of you who have been sharing, subscribing, and joining us each week. You are the best. We'll see you next week.